paper, it was very good. I could not have been more thrilled by any words that they had come from the Holy Father himself. I had such admiration and love for that man. And, uh, and years later, uh, I found myself pulled even more deeply, in a sense, into his life because I was privileged to be present at a meeting of the Pontifical Academy for Life when it was announced that his cause for canonization had been opened and I was there in the presence of his beloved wife and it was a great joy and a privilege. About six weeks ago, the National Catholic Bioethics Center was approached about republishing in English the biography of Dr. Lejeune. Now, you can't imagine all of the difficulties and technical obstacles and hurdles that have to be overcome to republish a book. But it was remarkable, I think, that uh, Dr. Lejeune, from his place in heaven, uh, working with John Paul II, whom he knew and loved and are now collaborating, I believe, together in heaven, pulled this project together so that within six weeks we were not only able to obtain all the necessary permissions, but we were actually able to publish the book and have it here uh, outside. It's a, it's a very moving book, a very tender book, uh, written by his daughter, Clara. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce her now. She was telling us earlier that um, she was so disappointed that her daughter, who was born shortly after her father died, would never have a chance to get to know her father. And so she began writing an account of her father's life for her daughter. So once again, we see the intimacy and, and the tenderness and the familial context in which things seem to happen in the life of Jerome Lejeune and even after his life. And so it's a, it's a beautiful and a tender book. There are copies of it that are here. We would encourage you to read it and to spread the word about this great and holy man and invite others to invoke his prayers so that uh, he can be recognized as a saint that we are truly convinced that he is. So it's a delight and a pleasure for me at this time to be able to introduce his daughter, Clara, and uh, who not only is a loving daughter and a mother of nine children, uh, but also the president and CEO of GE France, which is no small accomplishment in itself. So it's a great privilege to introduce Clara. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very honored and uh, pleased and moved to be here with you today with my mother and my sister to speak about my father. You know, 20 years ago, we were a young couple. We had uh, three kids waiting for the fourth kid and coming and lived in Egypt. And uh, after a few days, we discovered there, w there was a small Italian club where we could eat good pasta. And since when I have been traveling a lot, I've discovered there are Italian everywhere, where you can eat good pasta and it is a mafia. So today, the event of today is the mafia of God of Italian people. <laughs> so it's really funny that I'm speaking today here in New York for the first time about my father in a theater. Because when he was a young boy, with his brother, it was the war. There was nothing to do, not that much to eat. But they created a theater, a mobile theater. And they would go around in the village and play um, for the people. And they did it for free, but they enjoyed very much their first career of artists. And maybe it's where my father learned not only to speak, but to speak in a very simple way so we could understand what we were saying, even if we were speaking about very complicated things, uh, all words about biology, and bring you with the hand to understand what is all about the human being. We. As Umbretta was saying, you know, the process of beatification of my father is starting. And in the same time when my father died, we created a foundation to continue his work um, and try to help the research 
how to, to save and to try to find a treatment for the intellectual disease, genetic intellectual disease. And since then, we have financed around 60, more than 60 program of research in US, more than 30 research team here in US, nearly 20% of the money we have gathered in France is dedicated to US team. So we were thinking that it could be a good idea to create a foundation here in US. And I won't tell you all the episode, but just know that there have been so many miracles, not only the miracles of publishing the book, that make that we are here, my mother, my sister, and me today to speak about my father. And the first miracle is Umbretta. <laughs> so maybe I will try to speak about my father in, in, in three ways. The first thing that he was a scientist. And uh, he uh, started his career as a young doctor. And he wanted to be a surgeon. He tried once. He missed the um, exam. He tried the second time, he missed also the exam. And the third time where we get there, he was so, you know, thinking about other things that he took the subway the wrong way. So he understood it was not his vocation. Sometimes, you know, making mistakes puts you on the right, you know, on the right way. So the trial and error of the life maybe guides you where you think you didn't know that you should go. And with then, he started in a in a hospital and discovered those children with this strange face that we call Mongolian at this time because they thought that they looked like the Asian people coming from Mongolia. And at this time, those uh, children were like hidden children. We thought that it was coming, from, it was hereditary. People were, parents were sh shy and ashamed of having such, such a child. And it was terrible. We didn't give them education and uh, so on. And uh, the, f the worst thing is though we were saying that the mother was a bad mother because she had certainly bad behavior and she could have had syphilis, something like that. So it was really terrible. You know, not only they had a mental disease, but we put a lot of her bad expectation or non-scientist explanation on the fact that uh, they had this disease. So he started to try to understand what was happening to those poor child, uh, children. And uh, on a very, very old microscope, he made the discovery, it was the first time that we could look at the chromosome on a flat way. He thought that there was something about the genes, but it was the very, very beginning of genetics. And he made the discovery that instead of having less than the other, the children with Down syndrome has more than the other. They have one chromosome, third chromosome on the 21. So they have more than, you know, they should, we should have only two chromosomes of each. On this one, they have three. So it was the first time that was discovered that having a mental disease could be caused by a genetic cause. And for that, he made this discovery in 88, in 58, the year that his father died. And he came to US, he was already well known in US because when he was a young researcher, uh, he came here at the um, um, the United Nations as a scientist and he was working with American teams and Russian teams about the uh, radiation, the X radiation. And I don't know if some of you remember that when you were going to uh, go and buy some shoes, you could have at this time some boxes where you could have X-ray to see your shoes. And that was really a catastrophe because that would give cancer, could have given cancer to everyone. And he made the scientific um, proof that it was dangerous to everyone to be exposed too long at the X-ray radiation at this time. So he was already known in US. 
and he come as a um, teaching professor in US in different places and he came with his research and he started with discovery and he said to everyone he met okay I've discovered that Down syndrome is caused by a third chromosome on the 21 and the 21 chromosome no one believed him so he came back and he published it but uh, everyone who had stolen him is this discovery he published it in uh, in um, in 59 and that was the very first time that we understood the very beginning of genetics and with that he became w the I would say the most famous scientist in France the first teacher in genetic in France the one who would give advice to the French president there were nine uh, advisor in science around the president every time that there was something a debate about uh, science and medicines in France he would be the speaker on the television and so on uh, he received the P Kennedy Prize in 63 and the funny story about that is that uh, when he came you know he came alone because he didn't know that my mother was also invited so when he arrived the people were saying you know uh, that uh, she was invited but he didn't dare to say that he was too poor to pay the ticket for my mother so hopefully they invited her the year after but in the meantime Kennedy was dead and he didn't know that the Kennedy Prize was a prize where he could get some money to make some some research for him so this is really that was really a time where he had a beautiful career of scientists very r respected and he was you know he knew that he could have the Nobel Prize and one day it was the beginning of the debate about the abortion in France and uh, one day he came back at home for lunch you know we had this beautiful childhood where our both parents were there at the breakfast at the lunch at the dinner my father didn't take any professional dinner because he wanted to be here for dinner for uh, have a family life and he didn't put his career in front of that and he really wanted to share with us the family life so one day he came back from um, his consultation he had about five uh, five thousand patient coming to his consultation every morning he knew everyone by the first name and uh, he told us that the night before there was a debate on the television and there was a movie about a woman who had her baby with a down syndrome and who wanted to and uh, it was the first time that we were able to make the diagnostic and want to abort and the woman came with her little boy 10 years old and uh, the little boy was crying so uh, my father told him why do you cry and his mother told him told my father you know we look at the television yesterday evening and uh, the debate was about how can we make abortion on children who has down syndrome because we could make the early diagnostic with the uh, um, um, the uh, amniocentes and the little boy jump into his arm and say to him you know I've seen the television they want to kill us and you have to protect us because we are too weak we can't do it by ourselves so he came back at home and he say I'm the doctor who wants to try to save them and to give them the house so I have to protect them and if I don't do it I am bullshit and it's the way you know he could have been the one who said okay I think what I think I know that I have to respect life I'm a doctor I'm a physician and so on but he said I have to say my voice and the way he did it was the way that he has always behaved is that he didn't did because he was a Christian yes he was a Christian but he did it because as a scientist as a genetist he knew that life was starting from the very minute of the conception and he was not fighting with moral argument 
but he was fighting by saying, okay, you can say whatever you want, but you can't fly. The reality is that at the very moment of the two uh, molecules are gathering, the human being is there. And you can call it whatever, but it's not a tumor. It's not a, it's, but it's, a, it's not a thing. It's a, it's a human being. And some people were saying, no, it's only a potential human being. So he told the story of uh, Thumb Puss, the thumb, uh, little thumb. I don't know if you know the story of, uh, of this. This is, and now you have so beautiful pictures of that, but at this time, they didn't exist. You could see this movie where you have something beating, 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 beating. It's red, it's like flowers, and it becomes a heart, and you can see after the, the, the body of the baby and so on, and after two months, it's the size of your thumb. And it looks absolutely like a human being. It has everything, it has the eyes, the, ear, the, the, the hands, the arms, everything. It just has to grow up. And what he used to say is that if you wanted to do his, you know, when you go at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, fingerprint to know, to identify the baby, you could do it. You had already all the, uh, his own, uh, his own uh, print on his fingers, so you could know that he was not only a human being, but a unique human being that would never be replaced it's a baby and it won't be another baby. So the way he fought it was to oppose the reality of the science against everything that would say about um, the debate on abortion. And it's also the way that he was behaving when the patient came to him. And believe me or not, I am the CEO of a company. I'm in business, and my job pushes me to travel all the time. So I was in the U.S. last week. I'm going to China next week. I was in India. Every time I travel, I'm meeting someone who has met my father and speaks about my father. I'm not at all in, in, in medicine or so in science, but I meet people who have met my father. And so many times they tell me the story because they have someone in the family who has a Down syndrome child and so on. And they tell a lot of story, but I want to tell you one story, which I think it's a very beautiful one. It's a young couple. They just have a, ch a child who has a Down syndrome and they are absolutely despaired. The doctor told them that this child has no future. And someone tells them, go and see Professor Lejeune. So they call, they have an appointment very quickly, and uh, the woman comes with the baby, and the first thing that my father would say, what is the name, what is his name? Uh, his name is Pierre. So Pierre, okay, come in my arm. So he takes his baby in the arm. He asks the mother to take his coat off, to wear a white um, blouse, and he puts the share, one share like that, another share like that, and he asked the mother to sit in front of him, and he sits there. And he puts the baby on the knees of the mother, and he would examine the baby, calling Pierre, and saying, looking at him on the knees of the mother. And at this time, the parents understand that they have a children. They don't, they don't have a disease, they have a children who has a disease. And they go back and they say, yes, I'm a parent of a child. And his name is Pierre. It happens that he has a disease, but it is a child. It's my child, and his name, name is Pierre. So it was his way just to remind to everyone that any life is worth to be living. We don't know anything about our destiny. The most clever guy can be a criminal and someone with a Down syndrome can be the sweetest person with the best love that we can have. It doesn't mean that it's easy. It doesn't mean that, but do you know any life, any easy life? There is not an easy life. But the only thing that is sure that as a doctor, as a physician, 
he would fight all his life, day and life, first to save them from being killed, and second, he would spend all his time to try to find a way to give them back the spirit that they miss because this is this chromosome that repeats the music of the life. And he had this wonderful talent to explain the science on the way that we all felt that we were clever people after that. And to experience the story of the life, he said something that was very simple. Okay, now I see there is a, long, a lot of young people. I don't know if you remember the small tapes that we had at this time. But we didn't have iPods or, uh, you know, this was not existing this time. So we had tapes. So he took the example of a tape and he said, when you hear Mozart, the uh, beautiful uh, night music of Mozart's, there is no musician, there is no orchestra, but you can hear it, it's on the tape. It is the same with the uh, DNA. The DNA is showing and reading the message of the life on this tape, like on a, on a tape band. So it just was the way that he could explain you how the genetic works and the fact that when a baby is very, very small, you could, if you could read his DNA, already say that he will love and be good in mathematics, if he will have blue eyes, if he will have uh, blonde hair, if he will be tall or he will be small, and uh, if he will be patient or be uh, happy, having a, you know, a happy guy. This was already in his genes. So, he was not forgiven for that, telling the truth. And at this time, taking the courage of saying that we had to protect the small life and the life of the uh, special, um, very young people, uh, he, uh, his career became to be, let's say that it is a disaster. It was for, he had to fight to find some money to make the research. He was considered as like a prior. And my sister who is re with me reminds that one day we were going by bicycle to the school and there were something bad painting on the wall, you know, bad painting blacks on the wall saying, you have to kill Dr. Lejeune. And I came back at home and said, Father, they want to kill you. And he said, no, 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 it's just a word, don't worry, and so on. So it was like a, a fight that was really terrible at this time. But he did it because he knew that he was, he, he would say that he didn't have any choice than protect uh, the young baby in the, in, in the life. And to come back to the explanation of the uh, DNA, the explanation he was giving on the Down syndrome is to say that some mother was saying, you know, it looks like he's not finished. He's more a child than other, my other ch uh, children. And in certain way it's true because instead of playing the music, it repeats the music sometimes. So it's like you have a... So the growing of the child, it's... Uh, going slower than uh, the other child. But what he knew is that it's not because they didn't have the uh, same um, brand or that we had, they have the capacity of love that was completely intact. So he, uh, he tried to um, not to convince. The only thing he tried to say is to say, I respect any opinions, but let me tell what I know and testify what is the truth. And what he was saying is say, the truth may, will make you, uh, give you freedom. I want to um, go back to the uh, 
I would say the third part of his life, you know, he was a scientist, he was a doctor, and he was also a Christian. Of course, when we were young, when we were a child, he would do every evening the family prayer. We prayed together. It was a small and easy prayer that we had all together. It was a moment of peace before going to sleep. And we were going to the Holy Mass every Sunday. But he was not at all a father that would put us a lot of pressure or speaking a lot of God. He would let us think what we want and pray the way we wanted and so on. Even if he had a very uh, strong faith. And I want to tell the story that uh, has been uh, so amazing between the Pope, uh, um, how do you say, Jean-Paul II? GP2, GP2, and there, sorry, GP2, and my father. The story starts that my father became the uh, one of the first uh, member of the Academy of Science of the uh, of the Pontifical Science uh, by uh, Paul, uh, Paul VI in 1974. And uh, when Paul VI died, uh, GP2 asked uh, my father to come for lunch and uh, he became, they became friends with my mother and they became friends. And my father came and was so impressed by the uh, clarity of the mindset of the uh, GP2. And so he was on a regular basis invited for lunch uh, at the Vatican. And one day in May 13, he went for lunch with my mom, with the Pope. They had a very interesting lunch, discussion about biology, human being, and so on. He took the cab to go to the airport, fly back to Paris, and in the taxi he discovered that GP2 had been attacked and he would maybe die. And at this point, he was sick. We had to bring him to hospital. And the funny story is that he had all the same, the same symptoms that the Pope. And uh, we discovered at the end that it, it has a stone blocked in the, in the bile that stopped everything. So because of the emotion of having been the last one who had met the Pope, uh, he, um, he um, had this surgery he had to do for, for because of, uh, of the stone on the, um, of the bile. He was very upset when we tried to make comparison with him and the Pope, but the reality is that when he became sick, um, the Pope was always asking for news about him and uh, um, he became sick in November and uh, we discovered that he had uh, lung cancer. And uh, he had around him, he has a great sense of humor, so he was always trying to find the funny way to say the things. So uh, he had two doctors. The one was Dr. Christian, and uh, the other one was the Dr. Israel. So he said, you don't have to have fear of anything because I have the Bible of the medicine around me. <laughs> so the way, it was the way he took it. And uh, uh, the day, so of course, he, um, he had to fight against the cancer, but he always told us, don't worry before Easter. Something will happen uh, if I, um, in Easter. And the fact is that he died the day of Easter. I will come back to that, but speaking about the Pope, he died at seven o'clock in the morning when the woman comes and discovers the tombs of her, the empty tombs of her Jesus. And of course, we called the Pope on the phone to inform him that uh, my father was died. And very quickly afterwards, at 10 o'clock, 
we had a phone call of our one of the best friend of my father saying I want to have some news because I've seen the Pope giving the benediction on the place of Rome and I saw that he was sad so I understood that his friend Jerome was dead this is was the relationship with the Pope and my father and my father came to the thumb of my father uh, the Pope came to the thumb of my father in 97 we were all the family gathered there we had to fight to uh, have some um, some uh, children with um, intellectual intellectual disease being able to be uh, there because we wanted them to be there but they were accepted and there was a boy called Roland who is now I don't know 50 50 years old or something like that he's black he has uh, he doesn't have the Down syndrome but he's or he has a um, mental disease, but he's really a very nice, sweet, sweet guy who always take of my mom every day and come and see if she is in good shape. So he was there, and the Pope spoke to him, and he came 15 years ago, and he said to the Pope, told him that it is a secret, and this Roland. When you ask him what the Pope told you, he says, I can't tell you, it's a secret. And I'm always thinking that us, are we able to keep a secret like that? Would we be able to keep a secret with the Pope was telling us something? So it means, you know, being clever or not being clever, what is it? It's all about being a human being and respect what the other, the promises that you have done. And to come back to the processes, to promises that you have done, I want to come back to U.S. Because this is really an interesting story. One evening, you know, it was in August, my father used to, my mother and us, we were, when we were children, we were going, used to go to Denmark because my mother is Danish, so we spent holiday there. And my father would go with us five days and go back to work and just come up at the pick up at the end of the of the holiday uh, late in August. So he is sitting in the office. Uh, it is really a time where he can make a lot of research. He loves this time. There is, um, you know, calm. Paris is calm in August. And receive a phone call of um, one of his friends uh, called Martin Palmer who is here in this room. And Martin Palmer was having, um, uh, was on the beach with his kids and they decided to eat crabs uh, for the dinner. So you know when you eat crabs it's very dirty so you, he picked up a newspaper, uh, paid one dollar to have a newspaper to uh, prepare the crabs. And uh, he took the off the front page, and uh, he they had dinner. And after he wrote the newspaper, and he read the story of a city called Maryville, where a woman called Mary wanted was divorcing with her husband. They were okay for everything except the fact that they were married for ten years. They were not able to have babies. They had made an in, in, in vitro fecundation, and they had seven embryos. And the husband was saying, I don't want her to have uh, implemented those embryos because I don't want to have any children. So we should destroy them because they are property. And she was saying that she wanted to have them implemented because they, those babies were already existing because they were embryos. So there was a debate. So Martin called the judge and said the court and say what do you need and they said we need an expert and Martin uh, Palmer said the best expert on the world is Dr. Lejeune. He knows the genetics, he's the father of the, the modern genetists. So he called my father and my father told her okay I'll try. 20 minutes after he called and said there is, there, the plane was full but there is one place in the plane I'm coming. And uh, but before doing that, he asked Martin, what did the mother say? And Martin told him, you know, the mother says to the judge, 
If you don't allow me to have implemented in my body those seven embryon, please give them to other mothers so they can live. And my father said, said it's the first time seeing the Salomon judgment that where a woman prefer not to have the kid for himself, but give it to be sure that he can have the life and be alive. So whatever I have to do, he had a lot of things to do, I fly and I go. And he testified in front of the court. And he asked Martin Palmer, what would the judge have to decide? And Martin told him, told him he will have to decide if it's a property or if it's a human being. And uh, so my father said, you know, a very little embryo is about being a human. So it's a human being. And he, the judge best made, made her the decision to give the possibility to marry living in Maryville um, to, um, to, to keep the children. It was the first time in the history of US that that kind of decision was taken. And if you want to read the story, there is a book about that, that describe all the, the, um, the debate on the courts about how to explain that the, starts, the, the life start from the conception. So, you know, I could speak hours and hours about my father, so, uh, but we have to go and jump on other subjects. So I want to leave you with two things. The first thing is that my father used to say that few science puts you away from faith, but a lot of science brings you back to God. And he had a lot of examples that where he would explain that the beginning of the humanity was certainly based on a couple. At this time, you had the Darwin story, you had, you know, the book about the chance and the necessity, the believing that human being has started everywhere on the planet. Now everyone knows that it's wrong. But because we didn't want that, the Bible would say the truth, even if it was in a par parable way. Uh, he was the only one who was saying that. So he was a kind of precursor, he was the kind of scientist that could see what was coming, uh, what, what, what was coming in the future. And he used to use the first sentence of the um, evangelist uh, Joan when he said that in the beginning it's a message. So he said in the beginning there is a message and the message is in the life and the message is life. You know the real sentence is the message is a word and the word the, and he transformed it so by saying, in the beginning, there is a message. The message is in the life, and the message is life. And I want to give the last word to, um, um, uh, Bruno. Bruno was the one on which my father made the discovery of the Down syndrome. It was on his carrier tip that he discovered that Bruno has three chromosomes on the 21 instead of two. And when my father died, it was in the big cathedral of Notre Dame. I don't know if some of you have been in Paris. He came, we, he came and, uh, on the stage and he made a testimonial. And he said, I want to say one thing. I want to thank my professor, because they all called me, they don't, didn't call him professor, they called me my professor, you know, they own him. I want to thank my professor for what you did for my father and my mother. And because of you, I'm proud of myself. Thank you.
Thank you, Clara. You, you have made this great scientist more uh, familiar to us. Huh? And uh, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, tomorrow, within the New York encounter, there will be a discussion exploring the boundaries between science and faith. The title of the event will be, Can an Accomplished Scientist Be a Genuine Believer Today? So clearly from uh, what you told us about your father, Professor Lejeune was a true scientist and true believer. So this is possible. From your point of view as a daughter, in what occasion did you notice that uh, his faith shaped the way he was working in the lab or participating in the conferences or simply being in uh, the family? Okay, uh, yeah. It, it, it reminds me two things. The first thing is that he, uh, when he was very sick, he asked us to switch on the television because it was a time where the American was going on an orbital. You know, the, there was a, uh, an orbital on the... On the um, I don't remember the station, but it was really a very amazing moment where the two stations were connecting to each other. And he told us, you know, what is really fascinating, the capability to the human being to try and over and over to understand the planet. But he said that the main difference between a human being and between uh, any animals, it's not love because animals are capable of love. It's not an understanding because animals can be able to a kind of uh, uh, cleverness, but it's a capability to admire. We never see any animal to admire a sunset. This capability to pray, to admire, it's really the deficient of the human being. And if I, I, I want to read it, one of the things that he was saying the one who first knew that he would have to die and then construct Tom's, the one who rescued his wounded fellow creature, took care of him and protected him in his weaknesses through long years. As fossils proved to us, the one who discovered art that went well beyond mere technique, the one who is one of us, not even a hundred thousand years old, possessed something like a spark of intelligent love. And that was the definition of the woman being in a scientist way. And the other thing he was saying, he was saying, you know, we have to be very careful because science is cumulative. But the, um, how do you say that? Um, be, uh, how, do, how do you say suggest? You know? The wiseness, yes, certainly. Being wise is not. So it's all our condition today, and maybe I would leave you with that, that we have, the man has, the, is very powerful today. He's powerful to build, he's powerful to destroy. We're living in a world of, of uncertainty for that. And the, the only certainty we can build is to be wise. And it's what he said one day, coming back to science, the Pope asking him uh, to go to meet the USSR president, at this time it was Gorbachev, to explain that on the nuclear war, the only way to protect the world from the nuclear war was not the technology, was not everything, was not the law, but only to be wise. So, you know, you can be a great Christian. And when he died, the priest came to him and he gave him the, uh, the, um, the benediction. And my father told him something that... Uh, was really, really amazing. He said, you know, Father, I never betrayed my faith. And I hope all of us, we, I wish we could all say that. Thank you.
again. And uh, so Dr. Lejeune uh, suffered for the truth, and he is a great example of how the contribution of Christians is decisive when the intelligence of faith becomes an intelligence of reality, as Benedict XVI recently said. So before closing, I would like to make some announcements. Mrs. Clara Gemar, in addition to be the daughter of Dr. Lejeune, as we said, is also a vice president of government strategy and sales at General Electric International and president and CEO of GE in France. She will offer her expertise in economics at the discussion that will follow immediately after this session on how to build a human economy for the long term in a post-crisis environment. So the meeting will begin in a few minutes at 4.30 p.m. in this same room. Mrs. Beard Lejeune will sign the book of her daughter, Life is a Blessing, at the Eurosis booth from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. tonight, at the same place tomorrow after mass from 12 to 1 p.m. Tonight at 8 p.m. there will be a special performance of the Tiding Brought to Mary in play by Paul Claudel. Tickets can still be purchased at the box office at the entrance for $30. And finally, I was reminded that New York Encounter is possible because of donations and the hard work of dedication of more than 120 volunteers. So we warmly invite you to support the New York Encounter with donations that we can make at the specific desk at the entrance of the Manhattan Center. Thank you. <laughs>